everyone, welcome to my channel, Babbling Books. So this is the first video that I've done in a few months. My kids are home for the summer. I didn't have a lot of time for reading. Um, I mostly listened to audiobooks of books I'd already read and done reviews about. So um, once they went off to school, I was able to do a little bit more reading and I read six books, which was a sort of weird, sort of weird amalgamation of things. But my husband and I over the summer were talking about um, movies that we watched as kids or teenagers and whether or not if we watched them again, if we would still like them. So we ended up watching Candyland. And if you've seen it, you know, Candyland takes place in um, the housing projects in Chicago. Caprini Green is mentioned frequently. I didn't really think anything about that at all. And one of the audiobooks I listened to mentioned Caprini Green. And I realized it was a real place. Um, which I sort of feel a little embarrassed about that I didn't know that. I knew they had uh, housing projects, but I didn't know specifically that Caprini Green was a real place. So I started doing some research and I became interested and I ended up getting um, four or five nonfiction books about the Chicago housing projects. Um, and the first one that I read was actually, it started out as a radio documentary, um, and that is Our America, Life and Death on the South Side of Chicago by um, Lee Allen Jones and Lloyd Newman and David Essay. So David Essay, in 19, I want to say 1996, he contacted um, a local elementary school and asked the teachers if they could get him into contact with some of the students. The majority of the students are all children um, who live in the housing projects um, in Chicago, south side of Chicago. And he was ended up settling on these, or not settling, picking these two boys, Lee Allen and Lloyd. And he gave them tape recorders to interview each other, to interview other residents, to record their thoughts like a journal. And they ended up making two radio documentaries, both of which won awards. And the documentaries were called Ghetto Life 101 and Remorse, the 14 stories of Eric Morse. So... Because the children were the ones doing the recordings and speaking into the voice recorder, there was a pretty, there was a mix of both sort of childish things where they play and have conversations with each other, um, but there were aspects that were very adult, shockingly adult at times. So it's not an easy book, but I think it was a very honest portrayal of inner city life um, in the 90s, which was when the gang violence was really reaching its peak. It was becoming um, a day-to-day -day issue in the projects in Chicago. But there were also moments where the boys were just being silly and talking about their dreams. And it was a mixture of innocence and hope and naivety mixed with some pretty heavy adult topics. So I can't say that this one really touched on anything political or really anything about how the housing projects were handled, how the finances were handled or anything like that. It was just about their life, walking to school, um, coming up with some money to go to the corner store, um, what it was like for their families inside their apartment, things like that. But I did enjoy this one, but it probably had the least um, amount of factual information 
but it was still a very good read and I'm glad that I read it. Um, after that, we have High Rise, Story, High Rise Stories, Voices from Chicago Public Housing. So this one was, um, let me make sure I've got that right. It was definitely the 2000s. It's the publication page. Oh, 2013. So this was the newest one that I read. So this one consists of 12 people being interviewed and they were all former residents of apartments in um, the projects in Chicago. So what really struck me with this one was how lovely it was. So the 12 people, um, because it was in 2013, the last high rise um, of the projects in Chicago was demolished in 2011. So they are all, during their interviews, they're reminiscing. And every single one of them, the thing that they reminisced about, actually, you know what, every single one except one. So out of 12 people, 11 of these um, interviewees were talking about how wonderful the community was. So there was acknowledgments of things like the elevators didn't work, the stairwells were dangerous, um, there was an infestation problem, there was a drug problem, there were problems with gangs and shootings, but the community was the part that made the projects home. So a lot of these people lived um, in the same building with their aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, um, grandparents. There was this huge amount of extended family just within walking distance. And everyone looked out for each other and helped each other. And, you know, if you saw your little cousin skipping school, you'd grab him and drag him back to the school and tell him, don't let me catch you skipping school again. And there was just this lovely sense of community. 11 of these people missed their life in the projects. And as somebody who's only experienced with the projects is through the news um, and movies, that was really surprising to me. And I'm that's the reason that this book was probably my favorite. Because when the housing projects were, when they decided they were going to be demolished, they evicted all of these people and just scattered them all over the south and west side of Chicago. Some people, of course, went other places, but the majority of them ended up in the south and west side of Chicago, which is still, from what I've read, the poorest areas of Chicago. But the community was gone. So people who had been, spent their entire lives within walking distance of almost their entire family, they were now in different parts of the city, the community, the sense of community was gone. Um, so most of them wish that they had kept the projects and just cleaned them up and fixed the problems. So none of them actually wanted from these people wanted to leave. They wanted to stay, but they wanted the situation to be fixed. They wanted the gang violence under control. They wanted the building maintenance to be maintained and things like that. So this one was probably, um, since it was the only one that was new, it's probably the best reflection of the current situation um, because they are all, like I said, they were all forced out of the, the project. So, um, and this one covers a large amount of the buildings, whereas the, book I just spoke about concentrated on um, the um, Robert Taylor homes. This one was many, many different, um, different houses or apartments or projects, however you want to say it. So that was a really good one. And then after that, I read There Are No Children Here by Alex Kotlowitz. So this one also focuses on two children, um, Lafayette and uh, not, was it Phoenix? Pharaoh, sorry. Lafayette and Pharaoh Rivers. So this one takes place in, um, begins in, uh, 1987, summer 1987. And 
it was probably the one that I found the hardest to read. It was the most emotional for me because Lafayette and um, Pharaoh, they live with their mother who um, also has um, their three triplets that are the youngest. And then she had three older children that were 18 and weren't living in the home anymore. So they lived in the Henry Horner homes, which were some of, from what I've read, were some of the worst places to live. There was tons of violence in those specific homes, um, gang violence, shootings. They were the some of the least well-maintained. Um, so the mom is struggling um, to make sure her kids get an education, that they receive the things they need. Her three oldest children um, are struggling with different types of problems. Um, their father is um, an alcoholic. He comes and goes. He doesn't contribute anything monetarily to the family. At one point, um, the father uses um, his ex-wife's apartment for his mailing address. The welfare people find out. They remove her benefits from her, which she desperately needed. And now they're like severely struggling. Um, so this one actually had a lot of um, factual information about how the systems were run. And I mean, just like little things, like at one point, um, women that were married, if you had a spouse in the home, it was harder to get benefits. So a lot of the men, the husbands would, couldn't live there. But then you hear on the news about all, you know, these people are being raised without fathers. That's why all this is going on. Well, that was the system that you set up. Um, so I found this one to be shocking and gut-wrenching as a mother reading about this woman trying to do the best for her kids and it's literally nothing but running into things that are stopping her um you can see the change in the boys as um time progresses like there's this one moment where the mom is talking about how she just feels like everything is so hopeless and then there's they hear gunshots and Pharaoh, who's the younger of the two boys that are the main focus of this book, he's asleep and he's crawling down the hallway because like even while he was sleeping subconsciously, he heard the gunshots and that kind of stuff is just, it's really hard to even imagine with all three of these books, but especially the ones where the children are the main focus, what, it's, what it would be like to live this way, but which is why I, I wanted, um, to read about these things because you hear so many things on the news and in conversations about inner cities, but I don't, I don't necessarily know how, um, how the finances work, which schools receive, um, help and money, which ones don't. Um, just all kinds of different things like that. And I didn't even know how the projects came to be in a, into existence, um, which is also something that I learned that was sadly depressing um, because, you know, that's how I, I found out that um, when a lot of um, uh, African Americans left the South during World War II to seek job opportunities um, up north and because there were so many um, civil rights issues and um, and violence going on down here in the south but when they got there there was a housing crisis there wasn't enough um, there was not enough places to live and white people wouldn't let them into their neighborhoods so this was the solution um, which is just one of the most awful things I've ever heard in my life so anyway so um, yeah, I'm really glad that I read these. I'm reading another book um, where it's just about 
the Chicago housing projects, how it was ran, um, the politics involved, the boards that were involved, why certain decisions were made, different things like that. Uh, I am enjoying that, but it's a pretty slow read because it has so much information in it. Um, and then after that, I read the 13th book in the Mercy Thompson series um, written by Patricia Briggs. So, um, I've mentioned the Mercy Thompson series on my channel before. Um, it's one of the, I think it's the channel where it's my, uh, my favorite urban fantasies. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the series because we're 13 books in at this point. So the 13th book was just released last month on the 22nd and it just continues with the story <laughs> of Mercy Thompson. I'm um, going give you a quick overview. Mercy Thompson is a coyote shifter. She's part Native American. And her, um, she, I don't want to give a spoiler. There is a werewolf pack that she's highly, highly involved with. And there, um, she was raised by a werewolf pack in Montana. And it's just a lot of, um, there's a little bit of romance and, violence and magic um and if you like urban fantasy it's a great series to try i did enjoy the 13th book i thought it was over too quickly i'm really unhappy that i have to wait another year or two to get another mercy thompson book but that's how it is sometimes um and then after that i listened to books one and two of the harry dresden series um written by jim butcher so, Harry Dresden. You find out in book one that um, Harry Dresden is the only wizard listed in the phone book. So, this is a world where mundane people um, don't know magic exists. And this is not like Harry Potter magic. This is more along the lines of Anita Blake. There's people being killed and this police officer, um, detective named Murphy, she contacts Harry and she brings him in on the case because she thinks something weird is going on. Harry is completely open about being a wizard. A whole bunch of the police do not believe in wizardry. They think he's a kook. But Murphy, she does believe him. Um, and so I love Harry. He is snarky. He is smart. He is funny. He has a dry sense of humor. I enjoy the side characters. Um, and much to my surprise, when I was listening to the book, I'd, I've read quite a few of them before, but this is the first time I've listened to it on audio. And much to my surprise, I start having this feeling that I know the narrator, but I can't figure out who it is. And so I'm like, okay, I think it's Jeff Goldblum, but it didn't sound quite right, but that was the closest I could get. So I finally broke and looked it up, and much to my surprise, it's James Marsters, who is the actor that plays Spike on Buffy. He's not really English. That's why I couldn't figure it out. Um, so he's American, but I couldn't believe that. I, I completely bought his accent on Buffy. Um, so anyway, so he's the narrator. He does a fantastic job, um, and he ends up doing an English accent a couple times for one of the side characters and you can a hundred percent hear Spike in it. Um, but anyway, so yeah, that's what I read this week. Um, I'm still listening to, um, the Dresden files on audio. I'm still trying to finish that last, um, the last book that I have about the Chicago housing projects and I'm, in between fiction books at the moment. I'm having a hard time finding something that's catching my attention. But anyway, so yeah, that was it for August. Let me know if you've read any of these or what you thought of them. Um, that's it. See you guys next time. Bye.